Hello and welcome to the Michael Harding podcast. Wherever you are, whatever room you're in, whatever space you're walking in, you're very welcome. It's March and as I promised, I'm going to read a little bit from a book called What is Beautiful in the Sky. It starts with an introduction, like a foreword from the author. It says, A life is not a straight line, and a memoir is not a historically accurate account of life. Memoir allows the story to become a lens for other stuff. So there are some events that I keep returning to in various volumes of my memoir, and some stories I present from different angles and in various contents. Memoir, in the end, is a creative act. It's a creative act and a fiction at the deepest level, wherein the author can reshape biography in different forms, not as a chronological history, but as a song of joy to the simple mystery of life. Remembering becomes both an act of love and an act of gratitude. If there's one thing for me that's the foundation of all religious experience, it's gratitude. And if there's one way to express it, it's in prayer. And if there's one way for prayer to work, it's through a lens, through a symbol, through living symbolically. So you can have a statue of a Buddha or Jesus, but it's when the image or the icon has been internalized and you're living on the inside with that mentor deity. And so there's a kind of a, there's an energy going from you outwards so that you're inside feeling that your mentor deity is present with you and and with the power of that, you're going out. So you're not being dependent on other people's effects on you. I think that's one of the huge differences that living symbolically or living religiously is from ordinary life. In ordinary life, there's a way that you're feeling all the time how other people behave affects you. And it may be a very real and true way to think about it. It may be that in the past people affected you in very destructive or negative ways, wounded you, let's say, in relationships or in your in your childhood. And it may be that you see a consequence of that, a cause and effect, that, that these things happened and therefore you are now, today, emotionally the way you are. It's It's a very real dynamic and one that... That, that happens a lot and is talked about a lot. And I am not a teacher or a therapist, so I'm nobody to disagree with that. But what I have found in life is that there is something which overrides that or dissolves the, if you like, the compulsive nature of consequences. You know, the idea that somebody slaps me in the face, I will inevitably, naturally, compulsively be angry or annoyed because of that. And, and that's living from the outside in, so that, that people are affecting me inwardly. And I suppose when I live symbolically, when I live religiously, it's like I'm trying to override that. It's not that it's not true. That is the truth. I get a slap on the face and I'm annoyed about it, but but I'm trying to override it with something. And what I'm overriding it with is the sense that that on the inside there is the mentor deity. There is the eternal perfection of Buddhahood, Buddha mind, or, or Christ, the cosmic ultimate Christ that is manifest, or, or Allah, the, the God that is everywhere and there being nothing but God. And that sense of a mentor deity inside allows me to live from the inside out. So I'm I'm kind of 
living in the dynamic of relationship with the God inside. And the God inside tells me to forgive if I get a slap in the face. Then it's it's okay. It's not okay, but but I have choices in how I react to it. I suppose that's the best way. And so you're living with this energy inside and it's it's not coming from yourself. It's coming from the idea that there is a greater and bigger power. It's it's that yourself does not end at the parameters of your own body. But the the sense of being in the world is larger than yourself. Wider and higher and lower. It's it's like all around you like a mother enveloping you. That is the presence of some transcendent being. And th there's a threshold in the heart when you are alone in your own being, there is a threshold where you can feel this sense of that otherness coming towards you, enveloping you, embracing you, and giving you the strength, if you like, to overcome the slap in the face, to overcome the compulsive necessity to react to what happens to you. In that sense, you're you're a product of your past, but you're not a prisoner of it. Because there is, there is something allowing you to override the dynamic of being hurt and automatically reacting and feeling in a certain way. So how, how do we access that Godhead, the God, the mentor deity? It's like, I suppose, if I can give you an example, I'm in a room at the moment, and I feel you are present in the room. Now, you're not here, and obviously when you're listening to this, whether you're sitting down or lying in bed or walking on a beach or wherever, I'm not with you at one surface level. So in what way does your presence connect with mine? And the most fundamental way I think about this is that when I think of my own self and I think that being the conscious being here is actually something that is not coterminous with the parameters of my body. It's like it's bigger than myself. It's, it's, it's like both here and in the ocean and in the sky and in the mountain. It's all around me enveloping me, this sense of being. I'm sharing this sense of being with everything around me. Now, when I think like that, then I begin to feel your presence because because you're sharing the one God, if you like. That That's what connects us. It's not just the technology. It's not just that I make a recording and then you have a facility that you can listen to that in your earphone or headphone. Or Actually, what connects us is the sense of being the mysterious sense of being that you have in this present moment, that you are aware of yourself and yet aware that that awareness transcends yourself, that being present is not just a thing you're actively doing in an isolated way, separate from the cosmos around you, but that the cosmos is actually engaged with you, entangled with you in a sense of being here. It's being here the same as you're being here. Now, when you get entangled in that presence, you're being entangled in the exact same presence as I'm entangled in here. It is a presence transcending time and transcending space, transcending matter. It's just the eternal present of being here. 
and we experience it all the time. We are never in yesterday, and we're never in tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes, and yesterday was never here. There is only now. There's only being here. And that being here is always the one being here, and it's not coterminous with my ego or my body. It's not me being here. In fact, the more I become aware of somebody walking in the distance along the beach or the white waves or the sky, the more I become aware of other things, the less I become aware of me. The sense of ego begins to dissolve. And in that sense, this entering deeper into the sense of presence or the sense of of, of being is, is, is like letting go of the ego. There's a lovely phrase in St. John of the Cross, it's the first sentence or verse of his wonderful dark night of the soul. He talks about, I went, I, I went out one dark night, one obscure night I went out leaving myself forgotten among the lilies. It, it just, there's something in you. When you begin to gaze with love at your child, when you begin to gaze with love at your beloved, when you begin to gaze with love at the ocean or at the mountain, part of what you fall into allows you to let go of yourself. It's almost reassuring sometimes. I used to find this when I was suffering depression, that it was so reassuring to... There was a blackbird. I remember a blackbird one winter's day, and I wrote about it in the Irish Times. Just watching the blackbird was a relief from depression because in, in seeing the blackbird sitting on a fence post at the end of the garden and listening, listening for the voice... It, it allowed me to belong to something outside myself because I was experiencing the same... It is, it's the same presence. There's, it's, if the bird is outside the window on a feeder and you're experiencing the sense of, you know, being mindful, being present to it, well, you're present. But you're not, you're not isolated in that presence. The presence is in the bird. The presence is in the food, the presence is in the tree. This thing called cosmos is is present. It, it's, a, it's kind of like, it's not a neutral static thing, it's alive. And it is present to you. It's, there's something hidden in it which is reaching out to you. It's love. The cosmos loves you. You are the cosmos. You're not any different from the cosmos. You are. You've evolved. You've emerged. And you're born. And you have a short time. It's impermanent. It's not going to last forever. In fact, you're a different person all the time. You're changing all the time. Yourself is not permanent. You can you could examine your body and say, where is myself? Is it in my arm? Is it in my legs? Is it in my nose? And you couldn't find it. And if, if you said, is it in my brain? Is it is just my brain, myself? No, you couldn't. So what is the you that is conscious? We think it's coterminous with the, the brain function. But there's no great evidence that, that it is. And if I, if I sometimes feel love, it's, it's almost like my whole body is, is, is emotional, is feeling, is conscious. It's not just a little computer chip in my brain. So where is the self? And if you describe yourself by your characteristics, like I, I don't like mustard, I like sitting at the sea. Well, a day could come where you love mustard, and you could get bored with the sea. You love cheeseburgers and you could get bored of cheeseburgers. 
And there could be somebody in your life that you love. And there might have been a time that you didn't. Or there might come a time when somebody that you really love at the moment, and then you would feel real huge negativity to them. So our friends can become our enemies and our enemies can become our friends and then there are a third category of people who are there and we don't know them at all. We have attachments to people. We have, we have a, a detestation of other people. And we have an ignorance of most people. And yet each one of them suffers the same as we do, experiences the same impermanence about death as we do, feels the same joy when they open their heart to the presence of being, the same as we do. So there they are, sharing in the one Godhead, sharing in the one experience of consciousness, and yet we would divide ourselves from them and say, don't like that person, hate that person. You begin to see how, you know, impermanent even your attachments and desires are. Your emotions change. And the huge wisdom of Buddhism is that whole sense of detachment, renunciation, where you, where you sort of put the idea of being attached unconsciously to somebody, disliking somebody else. You begin to treat everything with what they call equanimity. You watch it in a neutral way. It's like a river flowing. You see as the river flows and you watch what's in the river. But there's a great sense of detachment in that. And that detachment is very like prayer as well because that really, in a Buddhist tradition, that brings the meditator very close to this sense of being present with no thoughts no desires no anger being detached from the self and that's why they call it renunciation in Buddhism I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha the Dharma and the Sangha through the positive potential that I create by practicing generosity and the other far-reaching attitudes, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all other beings. That's just a tiny little act of refuge that a Buddhist would say in Tibetan Buddhism, Buddhism and, and it is so complete, so full. I take refuge. In the Buddha, it's like what I would call this presence, this sense of being that transcends who I am. So really it's, it's not a question of me finding God. It's a question of me letting go of myself so that the God who is already there manifests. My thoughts are like, my, my thoughts are like clouds in the sky, if you like. And God is like a clear blue sky. It's like an emptiness. I'm being very Buddhist in this now. But I think the two, the two work together. The two are saying the same thing. The two are, are like, you know, in the dark, two different people touch two different bits of the elephant. It's the one elephant. Consciousness or presence, God's presence. God, God in transcendent being. Unknowable to us is manifest in the cosmos. And we are the cosmos. So that when we get rid of the ego and the sense of ourself, the sense of our attachments and the things we like and our negativities and the things we hear, our opinions, even our, our view of who we are as a person, we get rid of everything. Just say, look, relax. Relax. Just be. Alaya, I think is. A, I don't know if I pronounce it right, but it's a beautiful Indian word for that sense of, of of being to relax in alaya. I used to always, when I'd be swimming, 
in uh, on the beach in Inishcrown about 20, 30 years ago, I'd often try and just float. And you'd come to the beach full of tension and anxiety and you get into the swim, into the sea, and you would just... I would lie back and float. And I would say to myself, relax in Alaya. Just being here. And, and the extraordinary thing about this sense of prayerfulness is you can get to that space. You can get to that space. It, it's, it's, as good as, it's as good as floating on the ocean. In fact, it is floating on the ocean metaphorically you're just relaxing into the present moment no matter what it is you might be sitting in an armchair you might be sitting in a car at the beach you might be you might be sitting in a coffee in a big city and yet you can always relax into a liar now what I'm saying in that moment that happens is you're relaxing into the sense of being being here now and in that sense you are experiencing love you are experiencing the manifestation of the invisible God and you know it because because your sense of presence in that moment cannot contain itself within your body and within your your whole psychological consciousness. If you do, then you're you're just staying with a sense of mindfulness, but a mindfulness where yourself is supreme. You know, you're saying, "Well, I am here. I am here. Look at me. How good I'm meditating now." The threshold is when you begin to say, "Not just I am here." But when here becomes everything and the I dissolves and you begin to feel that sense of here-ness, being here as just being here. And you begin to feel the relationship with you and the, the grass on the cliff or the stones and the pebbles on the, the pathway or, or the white waves or or the, the clouds, you, you begin to experience those things as also being here, because they are. You, you witness them, they are here with you, and yet and yet, the here that's in them, the presence that is in the, the, everything around you becomes a presence that's loving you. That's loving you. Because you're here. Because in some real way your life has been willed you didn't generate yourself I didn't make myself in the womb and yet I was knit together in my mother's womb the Psalm 139 talks about God speaking and saying I, I knew every hair on your head before you were born in the timelessness of God, the hairs on your head were already counted. And you get the same thing in Rumi, where he talks that beautiful language about, you know where he says, the, the face. May you have the face you had before you were born. And I used to wonder about that for a little while until I got my head around it, you know, that what he's talking about is the face you had before you were born is your eternal, deepest presence. It is the presence that lives eternally with God. It is the, if you like, in the imaginal realm where being is eternal, where being is being. And out of that comes the cosmos. And you are the cosmos. I am the cosmos. 
And we carry with us the imprint and the memory of the face we had before we were born. This is a very beautiful idea. Because in this sense, the past is unreal and the future is unreal. There is only now. But it's just continually manifesting in cosmic time. So here I am living in cosmic time in this moment, on this beautiful, wonderful day in spring, in March of 2023. And this is the same me that started the podcast three years ago and spoke in the same way about being present. And it's the same being present. It's just that it, there's a continuum of manifestation, which we call time. But the deepest originator of who this is, me, here, now, is not me. I didn't start this. I just came here. Somebody brought me here. And whoever brought me here will take me home. And that's where heaven becomes the place that you came from rather than the place that you're going to. So we come from heaven and we'll return. I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult in the modern age to have a sense of heaven. The world is so is so reduced in in modernity and in the way we speak, in a very rational, logical, modern way. And there's nothing I can do about that because again I'm not a theologian. But I only have my own experience. And surely to God, I have to say my own experience tells me that heaven is here and now. It's not at the surface, but underneath this moment, I still carry the face I had before I was born. I still carry some dimension in my heart of eternity. And if you are alone, and if you are mindful, and if you think about that threshold where your consciousness begins to embrace or feel the kiss of otherness, of, of the transcendent God touching you in that moment, in that presence, so that the presence becomes collective, it becomes not just you isolated, in your consciousness, but but you deeply belonging in the universe. And you get there. And then you feel you are in heaven. And without that feeling I think you you wouldn't just survive. So so you wouldn't believe this now. I'm I'm gonna tell you something shocking and that is that's really all just to do with gra gratitude. Like all I'm doing there, all I'm doing is sharing with you my sense that the most important religious disposition is this sense of gratitude for being here. And, and that's it. I'm, I'm touring the country at the moment. I'm talking about the book, which is called All the Things Left Unsaid. And... I'm simply giving examples to people and sharing with people every night on stage my sense of gratitude, of, of real gratitude for being here now in this present, to have been born. So just to awaken in that sense for me is, is the complete expression of religious devotion. Whether you stand with a, a mentor or deity in your heart or an icon in front of you or the sun in front of you, whatever it is that you use as a lens to to worship with, to to open your heart with, there's no doubt 
They're all the one. And the deepest level of that worship is contained in the natural instinct to be grateful. And I think that's an amazing trick, if you like, because people might say, you know, how do you pray? That's a really difficult thing. What would that be about? And being grateful is 99% of prayer. There's nothing else in it. Maybe there's 1%, which is the articulation of prayer, you know, the conceptualization of prayer. But even, even again in, in the great Christian mystics, you'll hear them talking about non-conceptual realizations. Non-conceptual realizations are also talked about a lot by Tibetan masters. When you get into really trying to listen to Nagarjuna, for example, he starts talking about non-conceptual realization. Well, I mean, that may sound difficult, you know, it may, it may, to sort of say, oh, I want to get to non-conceptual realization. Well, that's a tricky thing. Might need a, a degree, a PhD in Tibetan philosophy to get to that. Actually, no. Actually, there it is, an instinctive thing inside you all the time, being grateful. And I was talking last week, I just quickly go back, but, you know, gratefulness is very powerful, not when you're grateful for things that went well. You're blessed with a good home, you're blessed with a lovely family, you're blessed with a nice car or something, and you feel grateful. No, those are half of what gratefulness is, or what gratitude is, and the other half, obviously, is to be able to say you're grateful even when things are going badly. Big, big idea in Islam, that is. Big idea in Islam, to be grateful always. To see, you know, they'd use a phrase like, well, it's God's will. And you'd hear that in old-fashioned Ireland as well, and it would be criticised, you know, as some sort of, you know, ignorance. Somebody is very ill with a disease, and somebody says, well, it's God's will. And that's perceived in a negative way. You know, maybe they were ignorant, and then they should have, you know, gone to the doctor and decided it wasn't, you know, God's will. It was just bad evil. But I don't think that when... When people of faith in olden days talked about God's will, I don't think they meant it like God is sitting there doing bad things to you, like making you blind or, you know, crippling you with, with physical diseases. No. But I think that they were understanding that the universality of being, the universality of conscious being, the, the complete cosmic level of of presence is not just a sweet good thing it's it's a mixture of of turbulence and darkness and and goodness and that there's no explaining to some extent the darkness in the world that affects us through illness and and, and all the various ways that we suffer there's no explaining it you look at the cosmos, for example, if you look at what scientists can now show us of the universe, you, you'll see black holes and exploding stars and dying stars, and like levels of physical nuclear power in the cosmos that's absolutely terrifying. And we live with the beautiful oceans and the beautiful mountains and yet out there there are many animals that are savage to each other and full of darkness 
They eat each other alive. And we're animals too. And we do it. So to talk about everything being God's will or to say that, you know, there is nothing but God, that becomes a problem sometimes for people who say, well, that would mean that God is uh, some sort of malicious. But I think that the way that people meant it in olden days was in terms of transcendence, in terms that we can't understand the dynamic between good and evil around us. But we can sense that underneath everything is God. There is nothing but God. And how that works itself out in, in cosmic terms is certainly not for me to even speculate on. But I can get I can get the sense of gratefulness. I can get the sense that I am grateful to God. And I can get the sense that even when something goes wrong, car breaks down, or ill health befalls me, if I'm able to say it's God's will in everything. I'm grateful even for this darkness. It's a kind of a strong position to have, put it that way. And it's also a position that's saying that, that whatever the dynamic that I'm going through in this life, in this impermanent life, whatever the karma that I'm working through, whatever the suffering that befalls me, and with assurance that at the end of the day, there will only be death. Well, if I'm working from the inside out, if I have a mentor deity, if I have an idea that in the imaginal realm at the centre of my heart is Buddha or Jesus or Allah or Yahweh, then I'm working outwards all the time. If you like with a sense of perfection, but, you know, perfection is not the right word for it. There's always a point, there's always a point where I come to a sort of a silence and I'm lost for words and I don't know what to say because I cannot explain what it is to be here. And this is a, a cyclical thing that happens all the time and it's happening to me in this moment. That I am lost for words. I do not know how to explain to myself or you or anybody else what it is to be here. I'm sitting here. I'm actually in the car. And I'm, I'm sitting looking at a beach. And it is so magnificent. And I cannot explain ultimately what this is or even what I am knowing that the consciousness I feel embodied in in this person or that this moment will pass. It is short. It's 70 or 80 years for those who are strong. And then be no more. And yet being here, there's something that is present in me, that is present in the beach, it's present around me. And it's like being loved. And my only response to it is gratefulness. And if you ever want to know what prayer is, then I've just said it. That's all. Gratefulness. 99%. I was going to read the book. Well, the book is called What is Beautiful in the Sky. I wrote it during the start of the lockdown, and that's three years ago, and it's when this podcast was beginning. And I thought I'd read a little bit from it. And I will do that now, because I suppose, in a way, I wanted in this book to talk about 
what is beautiful in the sky. We were all locked down and we were all worried about COVID and nobody was sure whether this disease would destroy the human race or to what extent it would destroy loved ones. So there was a huge amount of fear around. And yet the response when everybody stayed still for a while in lockdown, there was a, a great response that was as if people were discovering the beauty of the world for the first time. And I do think that beauty is, is such an important fingerprint of the transcendent God. It's just like, do you know the way Rumi says, for example, you are not the wave, you are the ocean. It, it's like thinking, you know, you're the wave is like I'm an ego. The wave is the ego. You said, me, myself, I'm doing these things. But yet the wave is only a shape. It, it is the way the ocean expresses a shape for a moment. And there it is, there's the wave, and there it's gone. And we are like that. That is the intimate connection between us and this transcendent God, if you like. So everything that happened in the lockdown seemed to me to be just a stronger manifestation that there, there is an ocean and we are all just waves. We are a coming and we are a going. But ultimately there is no coming, there is no going, there is only eternal presence. And I wanted to write a book about that. I wanted to write a book that said, you know, this is beautiful. And so I'll read you the first, the first little tiny piece. I was surprised this morning by the heat. We'd been expecting rain. The forecast is for an end to the sunshine. All through the lockdown, my consistent companion in the garden has been the sun. It was so hot that even the water tank dried up, something which hasn't happened in 25 years. But things changed a few days ago. The sky, filled with grey clouds, met air and promised rain in the west, and that usually means us. It was as if the blue sky and the bright sun had stayed with us out of solidarity during the lockdown, to keep us warm inside and help us cope. So when the sun rose a few hours ago over Schlieveneren and danced in a blue and empty sky and knocked on the big glass windows of the bedroom, I felt it was calling me, and I went out barefoot just after 6 a.m. to examine the grass. It's tight enough as it is, but another cut today would crown it, would turn it into a lawn as smart as any golf links. You can't be too careful with the lawn when you live in Leithram. It's vital to cut the grass immediately whenever a blue sky is given. There's nothing worse than saying, I'll do it tomorrow and then waking up to find it's pouring cats and dogs. So even this morning, as I rose from sleep and moved lightly across the floor so as not to waken the beloved, and as I slipped out the patio door, I had a purpose. And I love this moment, always. I love this recurring moment when I am alone with only the woodland around me, the cliff and lake and mountain before me. I feel wrapped in a mother's blanket. I'm not religious enough to get up and pray, but the lawn is my rosary, and the trees are my beads. I finger one as I walk. I observe my feet on the lawn to see if there is any dampness, or if it is sufficiently dry to cut. This walking at first light becomes almost an ecstasy in June, when the day begins at 
4.30 a.m., and the divide between humans and all other animal life is at its widest. There are three or four hours each morning now when the garden is as clean and natural as it might have been had humans never emerged into the light of day. This is the time when the trees around me and the grass beneath my feet feel like a mother's touch. I am awakening in my belonging as the morning breeze kisses my old face. Although if rain comes tomorrow, the midges will return and kiss me too, or eat my face. And I saw a green fly on the back of my hand negotiating his way through the hairs. I avoid walking close to the long grasses, the Yorkshire grass that rolls like a faint purple ocean along the ditch, and the buttercup is still about, and the flag irises in the pond are early this year, and a tiny yellow gem with four petals that I heard described in Donegal as the Greek cross has taken root near the apple tree. Everywhere on these mornings there are bees, brown bees, bumblebees and little black bees. They've been feasting for weeks on the dandelion, but now the Albertine roses are opening for them. The foxgloves have grown their steeples, and their purple flutes are wide-open caverns for the bees' delight, and about twenty of them stand together in the shade of the woodland. It would be blasphemous to fire up the lawnmower yet, the big four-stroke Honda that sits in the green shed waiting for me. I go down and unlock the shed and ensure that my garden gloves are still on the handlebar of the lawnmower where I left them, that there is petrol in the tank and sufficient petrol in the red five-gallon container because I usually need about two fillings of petrol to finish the entire job. But I don't pull the starting cord because it is too early. Instead, I just walk about, noting how the yellow gorse has just about gone over, its flowers fading, but how the broom, the broom, almost the same plant to my eye, is bursting with yellow, so densely luminous that a painter might reach out to it like a lover. I get lyrical in the mornings. I cannot resist the glory of heaven in this ordinary place. And I am here. I am present. And today is the day we had been waiting for. And that was three years ago. But I can say that today is still the day. Today will always be the day that we have been waiting for. Today is your day to be grateful and to awaken, and to feel the love, to feel the love of God in the magnificent cosmos of which you and me are a part. And my dear friends, I am so grateful for your support in the podcast, and thank you for being here. Bye-bye.